Well, hello everyone. A mega uh, blessing to all of you who are watching us right now globally. Uh, we thank you, of course, uh, for your patience with me. I know I haven't been live for a while due to health issues. It wasn't just uh, me taking a sabbatical of some sort, although I've been recommended many times to take a sabbatical, although I don't know how to do that in ministry. But uh, we thank the Lord, of course, for his hand of healing. I am improving. Thank you for your comments, your prayers, your encouraging words. I received many of those and continue to receive them. And uh, we are so thankful, of course, uh, for technology that enables us uh, to be able to share with you, to interact with you, and to also do interviews as this today. And uh, today's topic uh, are going to be amazing and will be a blessing to many of you. And of course, our guest is a blessing brother, blessed brother, uh, brother Chris Claus. Of course, we are always thankful for um, his dedication to ministry, to serving the Lord and for the wonderful topics that he always proposes to me. I mean, I have a list of topics. I was reflecting on those today that he had proposed to me, and I am so excited that we have done one so far about who corrupted really the gospel, whether it was Paul or Muhammad. Today, we're going to talk about a very fundamental question concerning the divinity or the deity of our Lord. And uh, the Muslim claim, I was one of those that always claimed that somehow the deity of Christ was invented that the Council of Nicaea has something to do with that. And in addition, of course, that the Council of Nicaea is where the Gospels were determined and what Gospel was destroyed. At least this is the Islamic claim. So today with me here in studio virtually, our dear brother, uh, Chris Claus, to settle the matter uh, from a historical standpoint. But before we do that, I want to wish all of you a blessed new year. And I'm so thankful for all of you for uh, your support, your prayers, and we pray that you will be blessed by this show, that you will share it with your Muslim friends and others as well. And I promise you that uh, come the new year, starting next week, I will make every effort to slowly and gradually come back to the live stream, at least on average of maybe once or twice a month. The hope is that it will become a weekly thing. But uh, as you might understand, I need to be careful uh, not to jump with both feet right away, but we have to really heed to the advice that we receive from the doctor. With that in mind, I want to welcome our dear brother, Chris. Uh, Chris, thank you so much, brother, for taking time to be here with us. Uh, what a blessing, brother, uh, to uh, have you back. And uh, thank you for your patience. I know a couple of times we had to reschedule or postpone, uh, but I appreciate your understanding. Oh, not a problem, brother. It's amazing to be on here with you. Um, I love the uh, Syria International and what you're doing here to help strengthen the brothers and sisters in Christ with the scriptures. I um, mean, I think that the topic that we're speaking about today is very detrimental to the Islamic Christian discussions. Um, and I just I, I want to take time to thank all of the viewers out there as well. God bless each and every one of you. Uh, we love and, and cherish all the support that you show each one of us apologists that are here on YouTube trying to defend the scriptures. Um, so, Brother Al-Fadi, um, would you like me to jump right into it? or? Absolutely, Brother. So uh, let me just uh, start by asking this question. Why is the Council of Nicaea uh, so important? Just if you want to give our uh, uh, listeners and viewers just a, a brief, very brief, just background, if you like, Brother. Yeah, for sure. So the reason why Council of Nicaea was really important, uh, it was the first time that the Christians were able to gather together to assert a dogma amongst the whole Christian community as a, uh, a faith statement. Um, before that, for the 300 years of the 290 years uh, before the Council of Nicaea, Christians were being persecuted. They were being hunted down like animals and they were being killed. So Christians weren't able to gather together to have their statement of faith, their dogma. So it took, like we're, we've said, 290 years for Christians to finally come together to be able to assert the dogma that they've always believed in, that they've always declared. So that Muslims will understand that after today, that Jesus wasn't just declared God at the Council of Nicaea. He was declared God from the Gospels and on through to the Council of Nicaea because Arius and a certain little heresy started to creep in 
saying that Jesus was a created being. So the one reason to have this council was to squash any of these heretical views um, of our Lord and Savior, because in the infancy of the church, it was in such turmoil, like we were being, the Christians were being killed and persecuted, that many other doctrines did start forming. So the Christians had to start smashing those false doctrines the same way that we're smashing those false doctrines today. Uh, so I thank God that we were able to have the Council of Nicaea uh, when we did. Amen, brother. Thank you for that uh, brief background. Of course, this took place during the uh, reign of Emperor or Caesar uh, Flavius uh, Constantine, uh, who, you know, um, uh, let's say that uh, he believed that he converted, you know, genuinely to Christianity, but the Lord used him regardless. We don't know the heart of man. God used him uh, in a variety of ways to at least uh, institute Christianity in his case to be the religion of the empire. But in this case, he wanted really to have all of these bishops meet and settle the matter once and for all. So God uses any instrument uh, to the glory of his name. So with that in mind, brother, why don't you go ahead? I know you have some slides you said you want to share. So go ahead and I'll uh, make sure that those slides will be projected live right now. All right, so I've added them to the stream and you can take it from here. All righty, so the title of the topic today was Jesus declared God at the Council of Nicaea or before? That is the question that we are going to answer during today's discussion. So many Muslims claim that Jesus became God at the Council of Nicaea. But is this true? And how do we as Christians provide a meaningful response to this assertion? History provides us with the ability to properly understand what happened in early Christianity and what the followers of Jesus and their followers understood about God. So remember, to Christians, history is an amazing thing. To Muslims, history is the tool of the shaitan. And we will see why. So, what actually happened at the Council of Nicaea? Now again, I've, I, I've changed the colors, so hopefully you guys will be able to read the text. If not, and anybody wants a copy of the slideshow, just go ahead and shoot me an email. Um, I'll, I'll put my email into the, into the YouTube text, and you can get uh, the slideshows that way. So what happened at the Council of Nicaea? This meeting, known as the First Council of Nicaea, was specifically called to make a decision about Arianism, the belief that God created Jesus and that Jesus was not eternal or one with God. For the first time, the leaders from every corner of the church would formally declare who Jesus was in relation to God. So the Council of Nicaea was not to declare Jesus was God, but to affirm the belief that Jesus is God and not created by the Father. And I just want to say that again because our Muslim friends uh, are confused. The Council of Nicaea was not to declare that Jesus was God, but to affirm the belief that Jesus is God and not created by the Father. Also noteworthy is that at this time, not all of the Christian kingdom was at the council. The reason was because they were scared. They thought they were being brought together to be killed because for the last 290 years, they were being hunted and killed like animals. The end result of the assembly was what is known as the Council, or sorry, the Nicene Creed, along with 20 canon decrees and a synod epistle that went along with the creedal statement. Within all of these documents, Nicaea quotes the New Testament books as authoritative. Let, let me just put that out there. The Nicaea quotes the New Testament books as authoritative and acknowledged the supremacy and jur jurisdiction they actually held. So again, in 325, the Council of Nicaea affirmed the authority and the jurisdiction and the supremacy 
that the New Testament holds. Exactly, brother. And just want to emphasize affirm. They did not invent, they affirmed. And that's important. Exactly, exactly. And all 318 members recognized the rule of Scripture possessed already. They did not invent the status it held. The New Testament was being read, studied, preached, and declared as God's holy word hundreds of years before anyone at Nicaea was even born. And I wanted to put this in there because a lot of Muslims like to say that through the Council of Nicaea, we have the New Testament. They, they started to X off certain books and, and things to this nature, which is uh, historically inaccurate, which is why I said history for us is a wonderful thing. But history to Muslims is from the shaitan, and we'll see why. So, now that we know that the Council of Nicaea was not to declare that Jesus is God, and I'll also put in there, not to profess to us what the New Testament scriptures are and what they are not. So they didn't X out any books. They didn't add any books. Now we, now we need to look further back into history to see when people were actually declaring Jesus to be God. But before we do that, Brother Al-Fadi, is there anything that you would like to mention about the Council of Nicaea before we continue on? I just want to, uh, to uh, uh, remind people that as a former Muslim myself, I used to always hear these things uh, that, for instance, the importance of this particular council had to do with inventing Gospels like the Gospel of John or at least utilizing Gospels like the Gospel of John and later, of course, uh, uh, you know, denying uh, certain Gospels that would have lined up with the teaching of the Quran. So, so that was one of the biggest issues that were associated with that. Not to mention, of course, the idea that Jesus wasn't divine and somehow a group of bishops met and invented this divinity of Christ. Why? Because Islam, of course, and the Quran does not teach such a thing. So the attempt is to show that the Quran is still superior to the scripture, which right now, as my brother showed you, that's not the case. The Council of Nicaea was to affirm the scripture, the authority of the scripture, the New Testament teaching, and meaning that uh, no one came to invent something new. They actually argued against innovation. In this case, Arius, who assumed that somehow misinterpreted the scripture, like for instance, in Colossians 1.15, just because it says that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, somehow in his mind, this meant that Jesus was created. No, I mean, keep reading uh, verses 16 and 17 and 18 and 19 and go on from there. And there is so many other places in the scripture that affirms the divinity of Christ, Old Testament, New Testament. So I just wanted people to take notes, please. This is a very important topic. And as my brother right now will demonstrate to you from his survey of quotations by church fathers centuries preceding the Council of Nicaea, you will begin to see that the council really wanted just to unify everybody rather than to have any arguments over these essential issues. Mm -hmm. and, and that's 100% correct. And that is a, a wonderful segue into the next one. So the first person that I want to talk about is Polycarp. Polycarp lived from 69 to 55 AD. Now, just imagine this, everyone. Our Lord and Savior died around 33 AD. This man was born 36 years after the death of our Lord and Savior. Just imagine anybody that is older than 36 years old. 36. Only 36 years. Isn't that quite amazing? And he was a Christian bishop of Smyrna. According to the martyrdom of Polycarp, he died a martyr bound and burned at the stake, then stabbed when the fire failed to consume his body. Just imagine this. Polycarp was bound to the stake and he was set on fire, but the fire did not consume his body. Just imagine because his Lord and Savior would not allow that to happen. So to finish him, to kill him, they had to stab him. Polycarp is regarded as a, as a saint and a church father in the Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Anglican, and Lutheran churches. 
Now, both Irenaeus Tertullian said that Polycarp had been a disciple of John the Apostle, one of Jesus' disciples. In an illustrious man, Jerome writes that Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle and that John had ordained him as a bishop of Smyrna. Polycarp is regarded as one of the three chief apostolic fathers, along with Clement of Rome and Ignatius of Antioch. And if anybody has ever heard me speak, I mention the big three in Christianity, and that is Polycarp, Clement of Rome, and Ignatius of Antioch. So what does Polycarp say here? So Polycarp says, now may God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal high priest himself, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, build you up in faith and truth, and to us with you and to all those under heaven who will yet believe in our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, and in his Father who raised him from the dead. Polycarp, who lived from between 30 years and 80 years after the death of Christ, or 100, whatever it is, but 30 years onwards, c- c- professed Jesus to be Lord and God. This is century, This is hundreds of years before the Council of Nicaea. So when Muslims say that the earliest Christians denied the divinity of Jesus and they denied that Jesus is God, let's point them to Polycarp. Let's point them to these people that I'm going to be referencing. Ignatius of Antioch was an early Christian writer and a patriarch of Antioch. While en route to Rome, where he met his martyrdom, again, another martyr, Ignatius wrote a series of letters. This correspondence now forms a central part of a latter collection of works known to be authored by the Apostolic Fathers. He is one of the three most important of these, together with Clement of Rome and Polycarp, as I mentioned before. His letters also serve as an example of early Christian theology. Important topics they address include eschatology, uh, the sacraments, and the role of the bishops. So some of the, again, uh, Ignatius of Antioch was... Uh, a follower of one of the apostles, right? So he states here, the, these are references and quotes from him. And he states, being as you are imitators of God, once you took on new life through the blood of God, you completed perfectly the task so natural to you. Once you took on the new life through the blood of God, and we know that we've been that when we that when we're born again, we are washed in the blood of Christ. Ignatius of Antioch is telling us that God purchased us with His own blood, just as the New Testament tells us. And it, uh, the next one here: there is only one physician who is both flesh and spirit, born and unborn. God in man, true life in death, both from Mary and from God, first subject to suffering and then beyond it, Jesus Christ, our Lord. To me, this is, this is such a powerful statement. He's saying that who is both flesh and spirit, showing us the hypostatic union. Born absolutely, absolutely, absolutely ahead, brother. brother. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to emphasize these are very important statements, by the way. For instance, Polycarp's statement earlier, he was stating that Jesus is our high priest. Where did he get this from? The book of Hebrews. He says he's eternal. Where did he get this from? From the Bible. So uh, they're not making up stories, they can find support, evidence, pretext for all of that. So thank you, brother. I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you here. No problem, brother. No problem. And and anytime, whenever the spirit moves you to say something in here, brother, just go ahead and say it. I have no problem. And, and I just want to get back to here, who is both flesh and spirit, the hypostatic union, born and unborn. 
showing you the two natures, the divine nature and the human nature that come together in the one divine person of Christ. And it says here, God in man. What does Philippians chapter 2 tell us? That Jesus, who is in the morphe of God, took upon himself the form of a servant. God in man. True life in death. Because he beat death. And he lives forevermore. He is both from Mary, from the seed of David. But yet he is our eternal high priest, both from Mary and from God. First subject to suffering by being beat and being crucified. And then beyond it, being raised to the right hand of power on the third day. This is Jesus Christ, our Lord. This comes from the earliest attestations outside of the New Testament. This comes from people that walked, talked, and learned from the apostles themselves. And the last quote from Ignatius of Antioch. For our God, Jesus the Christ, was conceived by Mary according to God's plan, Isaiah 7 Isaiah 9, but from the seed of David and of the Holy Spirit, because Ignatius is trying to uh, relate to these people that the man Christ Jesus that walked this earth was from the seed of David. He is the Messiah that walked this earth, but yet he is of the Holy Spirit. He is divine, showing us the hypostatic union in the first century of the two natures, the divine nature and the human nature coming together in the one divine person of Christ. It's amazing that we get this testimony of who Christ truly is so early within, uh, within Christianity. Now, the next one that I would like to touch on a little bit here is one of our first apologists. And I think that every apologist would love to model their apologist strategies after this man. Justin Martyr, also known as Justin the Philosopher, was an early Christian apologist and philosopher. And he states, and, and this is powerful as well, and that Christ being Lord and God, the Son of God, and appearing formally in power as a man. Where was that? And angel. Where was that? And in the glory of fire as at the bush. So also was manifested at the judgment executed on Sodom. And has been demonstrated fully by what has been said. Amen. Now here, Justin is telling us. That when we look back into the Old Testament, that the prophets and the law spoke about our Lord and Savior. That when the Lord came to Abraham and he ate with him, he was appearing formally in the powers of man. But as it said here, manifested at the judgment executed on Sodom. We know that the execution or the sorry the judgment that, that was executed on Sodom and Gomorrah is in Genesis 18 and 19. Mm -hmm. This is where we see the Lord came to Abraham and, and he sat with Abraham and, and he told that uh, told Abraham that he was going to have a son with Sarah and that there was something that needed to happen and that two angels two angels went down to Sodom and Gomorrah and one remained with Abraham, and this one is the Lord, and this one is the one that Justin Martyr is identifying as being the right. eternal Son of God. Amen. And if I may add one more thing here, I love what he says about the Lord being an angel. I know some people are going to say, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you, folks, uh, if you study the angel of the Lord, there are many instances in Old Testament where we can argue and make a case that that angel was the Lord himself 
uh, our uh, Lord Jesus Christ pre-incarnate, pre-incarnate. Example of that, Exodus 23, verses 20 to 23, appearing to Moses. Uh, he is appearing to the Israelites also and their leader in Judges, the book of Judges, chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 5. And Malachi made reference to that because he was termed as the angel of uh, uh, the angel of the covenant or the messenger of the covenant. And that's in Malachi 3 verse 1. And the gospel of uh, uh, Mark basically alludes to all of that when it referenced this basically in Mark chapter 1 verses 1 to 2. So what I'm saying is we can make a case that the Lord did appear as an angel. In fact, the story in Judges 13 of the uh, announcements of the birth of Samson to his father, Manoah, and the mother. It was basically the angel of the Lord whose name was Wonderful, you know, and mm -hmm. Isaiah 9, verse 6, called him Wonderful, one of these five names. So what I'm saying is it is biblical, and these guys studied the scripture deep, deep, not just sur uh, superficially. So I just wanted to emphasize this. Amen, amen. Um, and, and I was going to go to Jacob, as well for the angel of the Lord, but I'm not even going to touch the angel of the Lord, brother, because you actually said what I was going to say when it comes to the angel part, because when it says angel, uh, Justin Martyr here is identifying the angel as the angel of the Lord, the Malach Yahweh in the Old Testament. Um, and the Malach Yahweh cannot be some just normal angel uh, because brother Al-Fadi, I, I just want to ask you a question. Uh, when you were a Muslim, uh, could a created, um, uh, sorry, could a creation or created being actually have the attributes of God? Oh, absolutely not. Of course, at least if you take the Quran at face value, it denies that. And it, in fact, it's incidentally, it attributes things like creation to Allah. Yet the Quran itself violates its own rule by attributing creation to Christ himself in the Quran. You know, that, that's a whole different story. But it's amazing how Muhammad actually was called by some of the divine names of Allah. But that's a whole different story as well. But to answer you, at its face value, no, no created being can have any divine attributes. Mm -hmm. And we see that uh, in the Old Testament, of course, the angel of the Lord is able to forgive sins. Um, he actually holds the name of Yahweh in him. And again, that may be a whole topic on his own, uh, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. So I won't get too far into that. And then it continues here. In the glory of the fire is at the bush. Now, I think that's self-explanatory. I believe that everybody knows that this is the, the burning bush story. And now I'm going to jump down to the next quote here by Justin Martyr. And it says, the father of the universe has a son. So he's basically, he's giving an argument. Again, he's, the, he's an apologist, right? So he's going to be giving you like an opening statement when you're in a debate. Here's his opening statement, like his first little. Uh, and he says, who also being the first begotten word of God is even God. And of old, he appeared in the shape of fire and in the likeness of an angel to Moses and to the other prophets. But now in the times of your reign, having, as we before said, become man by a virgin. This is so powerful. The father of the universe has a son. And then he describes who this son is, who also being the first begotten word of God, going all the way back to John 1. And, and Justin is proclaiming John 1 in his argument, right? He, he's, he appeared in the shape of the fire in the likeness of an angel to Moses. So saying, this is who he is. And we can even tell from way back in the beginning, because he brought himself to Moses in this shape and to all of the other prophets. And then Justin Martyr says, but now in the times of your reign, having, as we before said, as we, so it's not just me, it's, it's sorry, this is, it's not just Justin, it's Ignatius. It's the ones that come before him. It's the apostles themselves becoming man by virgin. So 
everyone was proclaiming, as Justin Martyr says, that the eternal Son of God, the high priest himself, became a man, took upon the form of a servant through the virgin because they knew the promise that God had given them in Daniel 7 and in Daniel 9. They knew that in Daniel 9, the son that was going to be given and would be born through this virgin would obtain a certain name. The certain name would be El Gabor. In Isaiah 9.10, El Gabor is used for Yahweh. No other place in the Hebrew Bible will you see the actual usage of El Gabor in that sense used for anyone other than God. And this son that was going to be given has this title. And Justin is using this as his argument against people. So way back in between 100 and 165, our first apologist was going to the Old Testament. He was going to the book of Isaiah to present the evidence that Jesus is truly God and truly man. It, it's just a, amazing to see the early attestations of our Lord and Savior. And for the last comment by Justin Martyr, he says, For if you had understood what has been written by the prophets, you would not have denied that he was God, son of the only unbegotten, unutterable God. And I want to mimic this to all of those Muslims that are going to be watching this live stream because we know they love watching Brother Al-Fadi. If you Muslims have understood what the Bible has said and what the prophets of the Old Testament had written, you would never have denied that Jesus was and is truly God. That's for you Muslims out there. Now, again, that is just Justin Martyr. That's not even the only one that we can appeal to. But we can also go to Irenaeus of Lyons. Live from about 130 to 202. You notice how I'm going up in the time frames? All before the Council of Nicaea. Amen. Amen. Irenaeus of Lyons was a bishop of Lundum in Gaul, which is now Lyons of France. And I'm going to different areas as well to show how far the Bible had, had reached. Now, I'm not showing how far the distance is, but you can show that these people are in different areas. So if there was corruption, they would have had to be in all of these areas to corrupt. But that's another topic. Irenaeus was born in Smyrna in Asia Minor, weirdly enough, where he studied under Bishop Polycarp, who in turn had been a disciple of John the Apostle. Well, oh, what is that that Muslims call this? The chain of author or uh, chain of narration, I believe it is. I don't like that term. And you'll see, I, I changed that term a little later on. I think that we changed it the last time I was on here as well. So we're going from John, who walked with Jesus, to Polycarp, who learned from John, to Irenaeus, who learned from Polycarp. Okay, so this is what Irenaeus says. For I have shown from the scriptures that no one of the sons of Adam is as to everything and absolutely called God or named Lord, but that he is, in, is himself in his own right beyond all men who ever lived, God and Lord, King Eternal, the incarnate word proclaimed by all of the prophets, the apostles, and by the Spirit himself, may be seen by all who have attained to even a small portion of truth. Now, the scriptures would not have testified these things of him if, like others, he had been a mere man. 
This is an argument against you Muslims that claim that Jesus was only a mere man. Irenaeus of Lyon is saying that the scriptures would not have testified to these things of him if, like you Muslims, say he had been a mere man. He is the Holy Lord, the Wonderful, the Counselor, the Beautiful in Appearance, and the Mighty God, quoting directly from Isaiah 9-6. And it says, Coming on the clouds as the judge of all men. All of these things did the scriptures prophesy of him. Irenaeus is telling us that we can go back to the scriptures. That we can go back to Isaiah. Isaiah was telling us who this child was going to be. He is the wonderful, the counselor, the beautiful in appearance. The El Gabor, the mighty God. And Amazingly enough, Irenaeus of Lyons goes to the coming on the clouds because Irenaeus of Lyons, knowing the Old Testament, knows who that cloud rider is. The one that is identified as the cloud rider in the Old Testament is no other than Yahweh. Amen. And Amen. He, and he is the judge of all men. This is why Irenaeus put that in there. And what did our Lord and Savior claim in the Gospel of Matthew, or sorry, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14? That you will see him coming on the clouds of heaven. He claimed to be that cloud rider. And all these things did the scriptures prophesy of him. And I think that the most important thing that I want to say about this is that he says here that uh, even a small portion of truth... Now, the scriptures would not have testified these things of him if, like Muslims, he had been a mere man. Our scriptures would not teach us, would not identify, would not proclaim Jesus to be our true God, our true Savior, the eternal high priest himself, if... He was just but a mere man. Wouldn't you have to agree with that, Brother Al-Fadi? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's fascinating what he says. And of course, I mean, this is why, Brother, uh, our Muslim friends, after four centuries of wrestling with all of this at the inception of Islam, they had to deny the scripture. And that's where they began to attack the Bible. Obviously, uh, the attack against the Bible does not stand simply because even the Quran acknowledges the authority of the scripture uh, regardless. But I love what uh, uh, Irenaeus here is saying, as you stated it correctly. I mean, it's the scripture, the word of God, meaning God himself who uttered these words is the one who is declaring him to be God. In fact, you read about this in the book of Hebrews, obviously quotations from the Old Testament. And as you uh, stated it correctly, Jesus himself at the trial in Mark 14, for instance, verses 61 to 64, when the high priest asked him, are you the son of the blessed one or the son of the most high? And he says, I am. I mean, our Muslim friends say Jesus never acknowledges. No, he says, I am. And then he added two basically references. One to him right on the cloud, basically, that you would find this, of course, in uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. And also he quoted from Psalms 110, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand and I will make your enemy's footstool under your feet. And I want to add one more thing to what my brother says. Do a study on the clouds and you'll notice that no one writes the cloud in the Bible except God himself. And may I dare to add, even the Quran acknowledges that no one writes the cloud except Allah. There you go. And I think that that was a, a beautiful description that Irenaeus could have give of who our Lord truly is. And I just want to read it one last time before we move on. He is the Holy Lord, the wonderful, the counselor, the beautiful in appearance, and the mighty God coming on the clouds as the judge of all men. All these things did the scripture prophesy of him. Now, again, for time restraints, and I'm going to have to just quickly go through this. Uh, I do want to go down here um, and do a few things, though. Uh, so 
for time restraints, I, I had to click off the um, the 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 slideshow, and I'm going to open it up because I do want to read some other quotes. Uh, but again, for time restraints, I won't go on too long of a speech because when giving references for this topic, I could honestly be reading them for hours. That's how much evidence we have. But I do just want to note some others who declared Jesus to be God before the Council of Nicaea and provide maybe just one reference for them. I'm not going to go into too much depth on it, though. Uh, Melito of Sardis, who died in 180, was the bishop of the Church of Sardis. And this person says, let's let me go ahead and get to it here. Uh, do, do, do. And here. And, and it says here that the Lord of all was subject to ignominy in a naked body, God put to death in order that he might. Uh, that might not be seen, the luminaries turned away and that the day become darkened because they slew God. Melito of Sardis tells us that the Romans and the Jews slew God. They put God to death. I think that that is a very, very strong statement. Alexandria uh, sorry, Clement of Alexandria, who lived between 150 and 215, was another early church father, and he wrote right around 200. And what he says is, This word, then the Christ, the cause of both our being at first and of our well-being, this very word uh, has now appeared as man. He alone being both God and man, an author of all blessings to us by whom we brought to taught to live well, are sent on our way to life eternal. The word who in the beginning bestowed on us life as creator when he formed us, taught us to live well when he well when he then appeared as our teacher that as God he might afterwards conduct us to the life which never ends. So what Clement of Alexandria here is saying that God, or sorry, that Jesus is God and man, and that he was the word who created us, and that he appeared as a man to be our teacher that as God, he might afterwards conduct us to the life which never ends, which is to bring us to eternal life, that through Jesus alone is the only way to obtain salvation. Oh, sorry if I'm clicking back and forth. Uh, oh, no, no problem. And um, Tertullian as well, and Hippolytus of Rome. I'm just going to go ahead and read them here and... I'm probably not it. I'm not going to give their references, but they also did reference Jesus as being God. Now, uh, here, let me bring this back open again and post it in full screen. And we're going to say, so when a Muslim asks you why Jesus was declared almost 300 years after his death, that he was declared God almost 300 years after his death, we can simply explain to them that they've been lied to by their sheikhs and their imams and that Jesus was not declared God at the council. Yet he was declared God in the New Testament and those that followed the apostles and those that followed them and on down the line. Again, we do not have a chain of narration as the Muslims do. Narrations are told stories. We have a chain of authorship that dates to the time of Christ. This is the, the change that I've always stated. I don't like the, the term, the chain of narration, because narrations are stories that are subject to change. We have the chain of authorship of who our Lord and Savior truly is. And I think that this is how us Christians should address it. Now, I will end this presentation, this presentation with a verse from the Quran and 
a logical question to follow. I'll read Surah 3, verse 55, and I'm not going to focus too much on the start of the verse because we have before. What I'm focusing on is the end. And it says here in the Yusuf Ali translation, Behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme. And I will make those who follow thee superior to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. Then shall ye return unto me and I will judge between you the matters where you dispute. So what Allah is actually saying here is he's telling Jesus, I'm going to take your faithful followers, those ones that truly believe, and I'm going to strengthen them. I'm going to make them superior over those who don't believe, who don't have the faith. So my question to the Muslims out there, if Allah strengthened the followers of Jesus, then how could they all believe that Jesus is God? And how could they teach that Jesus is God if it's not true? Yep. I mean, that's another uh, uh, colossal example of the failures of Allah who doesn't know what he's doing. But of course, Allah knows best. Wink, wink. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. So all that to say is that uh, this is a question, and I, I can tell you, a, a lot of our Muslim friends are waking up to the reality of the fact that there are so many debacles like this, so many controversies, so many contradictions, discrepancies in their own books. So they're waking up to that, and we praise God for the work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts, and we always welcome them to uh, interact with us, uh, you know, interact with our dear brother. Uh, for instance, brother, what is your website so people know where to go or your YouTube channel and how they can reach out to you as well? Because we're not here to exclusively hoard things, you know. We want to be a blessing to other platforms as well. So go ahead, brother. Oh, yeah, for sure. So if anybody just uh, goes on YouTube and they search Chris Claus, just as you see it here on the screen, um, it'll bring you right to my channel. Um, and actually tomorrow, weirdly enough, um, I'm going to be having a discussion with somebody that denies that Jesus is God. And I'm bringing in the junior Sam Shimon to be able to deal with them. Now, I'm not sure if you know who I'm talking about, Mr. Al or Brother Al-Fadi, uh, but his name is Albi Al, the Assyrian guy. He's a mm -hmm. brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, so he's going to come in. He's going to have a discussion. I think it's a Hebrew Israelite. Um, that's going to be having the discussion with them. Uh, so I, I can't wait to get right into the Old Testament and, and hit them with the angel of the Lord verses. Amen. And we're, uh, I think you are on Clubhouse, or at least uh, that's what uh, the notifications always say, Chris Claus talking. I'm like, well, man, he talks all the time uh, because sometimes it's in the middle of the night. So I'm wondering if that's the name of the room or, or what is that? Yeah, so Clubhouse is an app that you can download on your phone or you can use club deck on the computer. Um, and it's an app where you can openly go in and you can have discussions uh, with uh, Muslims, Jews, any faith really. Um, and yes, brother, um, I do sometimes go on there at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, noon, seven o'clock at night. It's just whenever the Lord moves you to be able to, uh, speak about the Bible. And a lot of times there's there's rooms and clubhouses uh, where Muslims will be attacking um, Christians that are newer to the faith. Because you know as well as I do, Muslims like to attack the people that don't have the knowledge so that they can corner them and try to get them out of the faith. Um, so I'll receive texts or I'll receive emails from other people that are in the room that don't have the ability to join the stage and say, brother, can you come in and can you uh, this is what they're talking about. Can you jump in and help out the brother or sister? And as long as I have time, it, it doesn't matter if I work in four or five hours. If the Lord calls me to do something, the Lord calls me to do something. I'll suffer uh, with not getting any sleep for that day. I have no problem with that. Um, so that's one thing that I do like to do is to go on there and preach the gospel, uh, defend the scriptures against the Islamic uh, ideologies. 
Amen, amen. And I'm I'm really uh, trying my best to uh, make my way into Clubhouse. In fact, I talked to Brother Chris to see if I can jointly uh, do something with him simply because not only I don't have the time, but I've been really uh, dealt a number of health issues in the last uh, couple of months. So I want to take it easy. And uh, also I want to focus on my PhD work. Uh, the time is is starting to get near for the you know conclusion of the research. So I covet everybody's prayers for that. Uh, I want to announce to everyone that the Lord has blessed us uh, in the month of December with one of the greatest gifts ever, and that's a grandchild. Mm -hmm. uh, I know many people tell me you look young. Thank you. I appreciate that. I know I do. But um, at the same time, what a blessing to have now a legacy to leave behind, not genealogically speaking, but also a legacy about the Lord for the next generation as well. So we're so thankful uh, for technology. Uh, as uh, my brother mentioned, you can always go to these apps, go to the uh, YouTube channel, watch what we do, learn from that, take notes, and so on and so forth. Somebody was asking again the channel name. As my brother mentioned, just Google his name, Chris Claus. And I think that's the name of your channel, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. Just Chris Claus. I, I didn't bring up, I didn't make up any names or anything else like that. I'm just going with Chris Claus just so it's easier to find. That's all. Amen. Uh, I mean, I'm, I want our brother to stay with us, uh, hopefully, for the next uh, five to 10 minutes. If there are questions, obviously. So, people, I encourage you to ask questions about the topic, please, the topic that we have just addressed. Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, super chat questions will be highlighted immediately. It makes it easy for me to see them anyway. But all that to say, please, if you have any questions, go ahead and put that right here. So, brother, um, you gave me a list of a number of topics. So, uh, you and I need to connect and take a look yet at another one of those topics. Hopefully we can uh, do another show like this. But uh, if you want to tell people, what is it that you're doing, um, you know, in the coming uh, days or weeks, for instance, uh, what are the topics that you are going to be uh, spotlighting or highlighting in Clubhouse or maybe even your own, in your own channel, if you know, basically, upfront, uh, what you are going to be addressing, meaning not uh, impromptu or something that uh, just was brought up to your attention. Oh, yeah, sure. In, in the next couple of weeks, uh, we will be discussing the angel of the Lord, of course, tomorrow with Albiel and the uh, Hebrew Israelite gentleman. Uh, but we will be going back into the Quran following that because I do have some holidays right now. So I want to get it. I, I do have two or three live streams planned before January 3rd. So keep an eye out for those. Uh, one topic, of course, is going to be the morality of Muhammad and the morality of the apostles, because I will not put the morality of Jesus according to the morality of, of Muhammad. Um, our Lord and Savior should never be compared to that. Uh, individual anyway. So I'm going to compare the apostles' morality and, and the teachings of morality in the Bible to the teachings of morality um, in Islam. And I think that I'm going to be bringing a, a brother of mine called Paul Bishop up. I know that he wants to address uh, Surah 65.4 um, and the prepubescent marriages. Um, that is one of the biggest issues right now in Clubhouse. Muslims are actually denying uh, the prepubescent marriages uh, they're, and they're coming up with elaborate um, uh, things to, to mention. Uh, so we want to hammer that one down, try to get all of the Islamic sources out there for them. Amen. It, uh, uh, the, I, I remember an apostle, uh, may peace be upon him, by the name of David Wood, says the miracle of reinterpretation. You know, so that's what our Muslim friends do. They reinterpret things when they are in the, uh, you know, pushed against the corner. So sure, yeah, you can say there is no such marriage. Then go ahead and explain to me then what your own scripture is saying in chapter sixty-five, verse four, as an example. Yeah, and what uh, I think what Paul is going to do is he's going to bring up Surah thirty-three, forty-nine. And then contrast that with Sir 65.4. Um, and then, because we want to present, uh, in one instance, the, the woman that is not touched during marriage does not have an idda, but, but the young girl that is touched does have an idda. So we have to describe what the idda is, uh, why they have it, and things to that nature. So I think it's really uh, beneficial for that. Um, and then I think we're going to go to um i honestly am trying to get al-fadi on my channel everyone 
We need to get Brother Alfadi over to my channel. <laughs> yeah, publicly. I want to apologize. It's really the surgeries that got in the way, but Brother, I will make myself available. Just give me a couple of options, and absolutely, it's an honor. And now I'm not going to tell you what the topic is that I'll have Brother Alfadi on because we still have to discuss that as well. But that will be in the upcoming uh, live streams as well uh, because uh, Brother Alfadi specializes in certain things. And I think that we need to draw some of that 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 knowledge that he has out of him so that we can also spout that same knowledge uh, to these Muslims as well. Uh, but yeah, that that's just what's going to be going on on my channel, on, on the Chris Claus YouTube channel in the next little while. And also, Brother Al-Fadi, can I make one announcement? Of I, course. I, I was going to do it on my live stream last night, and I got so busy I had to cancel my own live stream. But my dear brother... Eric the Kaffir, he has a, a YouTube channel called The Cross and the Crescent. The, mm -hmm. cr the Cross and the Crescent has been away for about a couple of months. Eric's been away dealing with a lot of issues and things to that nature in his life. It mm -hmm. is coming back January the 8th at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's, That's right, everyone. The Cross and the Crescent will be back on January the 8th. That's wonderful. Uh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. I know he does wonderful work. And, um, I know, he did really invite me to be on his channel. I just haven't been able to, to do so anyway. But all that to say, brother, we are so thankful. One question I saw just uh, asking about the slides. I, I, I guess you did mention you're going to make the slides available. You know, one of two things, if you want to give people your email, or if you want to send it to me and we can post it in the description box, uh, whatever you prefer, obviously, but uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do to make these slides available for people. I, I agree. I, I, I would prefer to take the sec second option. Excellent. Now I, I have no problem giving people my email, uh, but we know how trolls are in the oh, yeah, of world. Course, of course. I just email. thought maybe I heard you say something like that, but absolutely. Once yep. you make them available for me, I'll put them in a description box for people to have them. In yeah, fact, sure. uh, folks, I may even put it in the community uh, section of YouTube uh, so that you can have it there as well. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, yeah, what I'll do after the live stream here, Brother Alfadi, is I'll just upload it to my Google Drive and then send you the Google Live drink or the Google Drive link. That'll be great. And, Brother, uh, give your uh, reference to your YouTube channel because we want to be a blessing to you. We want to give credit to your channel, Brother. I mean, this is your work, and I don't want people to think like I'm the one who created this. In fact, put your name on the title, put your channel a reference on the title or at the end. Uh, we want to make sure that we are a platform to bless others as well. Uh, you've always been a platform to bless others, Brother Alfadi, and that's one reason uh, that I've always loved you as well. It doesn't matter if it's a known apologist or just an apologist out there that wants to get the truth out. You've been able to pro provide your platform to people like David Wood, uh, to people like uh, me, to people like Lloyd, to people like at all types of people to be able to come on here uh, so it's amazing the type of people like even adam seeker and rob christian and everybody else uh, so you are definitely a blessing for us as well brother thank you my brother and i want to tell people that uh, be on the look for a new video series with dr j smith uh, it's actually an ongoing we did 40 videos so far and we're not even done it has to do with a book uh, and i believe the book's name uh, was creating uh, the quran uh, I, I want to say that's the name. In fact, give me a second, brother. I, I, I just want to uh, make sure I'm not butchering, uh, you know, the name. It's by Dr. Shoemaker. So I'm going to just go there quickly. Uh, I want people to uh, be on the look for that as well. And it is, uh, give me a second, Quran, uh, Shoemaker. And uh, let's see. Yes, it's called Creating the Quran. I just want to make sure. I, I don't want to really... Um, come up with the fake names. The book is called Creating the Quran, a Historical Critical Study by Stephen Shoemaker, a historian. You know, uh, he has a PhD and uh, or at least uh, some of the things that he focuses on are uh, historical things. So I want to bless, uh, you know, the work and the efforts that he made. Uh, you guys can, if you want to start getting that book, 
creating the Quran in advance because when you watch the video series, you'll track along with us. And it's, to my knowledge, uh, the first of its kind, a book by a scholar that does question the uh, holes in the narrative uh, in the history of Islam and the origin of Islam and the Quran. So, so that's why I liked it because it does really um, uh, jive with the theme that we've been taking. Now, I want to be clear here, folks. Uh, while I bring scholars who have opinions about Muhammad, whether he existed or not, the Quran, uh, how did it evolve or not, and so on and so forth, I want to be clear that that's their opinion. I am always taking the scholarly approach that, you know, we can always address what we have at hand, but we leave the door open for possibility of newer discoveries. So that's what I wanted to just emphasize. I'm in no way trying to endorse this view over that view, but it's fascinating that there are so many evidence. Once you put these pieces together, you begin to see a picture emerging that does challenge the standard Islamic narrative known as sin or the acronym that has been chosen for it. So, so I just want to be clear here that uh, no one thinks that somehow I'm dogmatic about this view or that view. No, I take the scholarly approach that you have to leave your uh, the door open and you have to be open minded about what might be discovered tomorrow that could poke a hole in your own thesis uh, so that you need to be careful with that. That's just my uh, own opinion. Uh, last word to you, brother. No, I, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on here, brother. Uh, God bless you. God bless your family. Also, God bless that dear little little one, your, your special gift uh, in this month Amen. of December. Um, and also, God bless everyone out there in the audience. God bless your families. Um, thank you for all the support that everyone has shown me. Uh, and also, thank you for the support that you're showing Brother Al-Fadi and the rest of the soldiers that are out here on the front line uh, that combat the evil on a daily basis. As Carmel said, um, there is a lot of warriors out in the field. And uh, we need the prayers because the harvest is ripe, but the labors are few. And Amen. that's and that's one of the things that I just love to leave it off on. And, and just God bless everyone. And thank you so much for having me on, brother. Thank you, my brother. It's an honor and a privilege. And I definitely, you and I will uh, begin to make an effort. Uh, really, it's my hope that at least on average of once every four to six weeks, I want to have you. And uh, we want to talk about uh, things that you've done, uh, point people to them, but also talk about topics. Folks, I want to also point you out to a YouTube channel that we have launched at least over a year ago called The Kings, with an apostrophe, it's The Kings Church, where it houses most of my sermons. Yes, I do preach, but we didn't want to confuse the issues and have my sermons in Sierra International because people are going to say, wait a minute, is this a sermon channel or is this you know, an apologetics. Yeah. So we do have ha those housed there. And anytime I come across sermons that I've done in the past, we try to uh, upload them there. So if you want to uh, learn a thing or two about the book of Ezekiel, go there. I've been preaching from Ezekiel and uh, probably will continue doing so for a while. So thank you again, brother. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we wish all of you a very blessed new year. And we ask the Lord that uh, 2023 be a year of more fruits among our Muslim friends and others who do not know the Lord, that they will come and flock to uh, into the kingdom because of the truth of knowing the Son, and that truth will set them free. We thank the Lord that myself and my brother here and others like us are nothing but a conduit to bring glory to his glorious name. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is Al-Fadi, over and out. God bless. Take care.